Hello, people, and welcome back to The Vanishing Hour. Today's episode is going to be a little different and a lot longer. We are going to be covering a series of mysterious yet presumed accidental drownings that encompass a theory developed by retired New York detectives. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. It's been covered many a times, but hopefully not as commonly as I am about to now. This is the theory of the smiley face killers. Now, most of popular media surrounding it has sensationalized the sort of batshit crazy aspects to this theory. And I think it's really polarized the concept and even some of the deaths that are now associated with the theory. But I decided I wanted to cover this after watching one of these media coverages of it. Uh, Oxygen has a docu-series by the name of Smiley Face Killers, The Hunt for Justice. And that's kind of how I stumbled upon the theory to begin with. I'd say um, prior to this, which was about, sorry, six months ago, maybe? If that, I, I can't remember. About six months ago, sitting on the couch, flipping through Hulu when I stumbled across it. And up until that point, I really didn't have any interest in pursuing this theory just because, again, I only saw the weird, cuckoo, batshit, crazy side of it. But I figured, what the fuck, why not? There's nothing else to watch anyway. So I put it on, and interestingly enough, the docuseries didn't necessarily cover the theory itself, but rather these, like, random cases that they felt may possibly be related. Now, the cases themselves were actually really compelling. There was a lot of contradictory evidence in these cases, and yet somehow the ruling was that they were accidental drownings, and it was case closed for many of them. So the cases themselves stood out to me, um, and that had me deciding to kind of do a, an episode that covered the origins of how this theory came to be, because at the end of the day, I think it probably started from a very factual standpoint, and now it's kind of gone off the rails a little, in my opinion, but we're going to focus on uh, the origins of it, how it came to be, the starting cases that kind of were the building blocks for the theory and how it's since branched out. We'll talk about um, how it got its name and pretty much where it, where it stands today. So with that, um, if you're interested in, um, in either watching that docuseries, again, it's called The Smiley Face Killers, The Hunt for Justice. Again, the cases on them that they cover are extremely interesting. I do recommend that. Kind of ignore all the other stupid shit that's going on during it. Um, I also read a couple of books. I haven't finished all the books yet, but the books that I did uh, rent or purchase were The Case of Drowning Men by Eponymous Rocks. Um, case Studies in Drowning Forensics, which is actually really good. It's by Kevin Gannon and Dr. Lee Gilbertson, two of the founding members of the Smiley Face Killer Theory. And then lastly, I got uh, The Smiley Face Killers by Steph Young. I just started reading that. I don't really have an opinion formed on it yet. I'm only like on page three or four, but so far it's interesting. So let's uh, let's dive in. So just to give you guys a little background on the actual theory itself, in case you're not familiar with it, um, it's a theory created by two retired New York detectives by the name of Kevin Gannon and Anthony Duarte, uh, as well as a professor slash doctor named Lee Gilbertson, who is um, a gang expert and a professor at St. Cloud State U University. Learning up a storm here. So the basic premise of the theory is that over the span of the 1990s and well into the 2010s, roughly 45 or more college-age males, mostly Caucasian, were somehow lured away from their group of friends while having a night out partying, drinking, celebrating, whatever the case may be, where they were then potentially drugged, tortured, and held captive before being drowned and left in bodies of water. Now, something I didn't know was that the theory began to take shape in a town called La Crosse, Wisconsin. 
but that it eventually started spreading kind of throughout the entire northern U.S., uh, skirting the Canada border. Now, the term smiley face was coined when it was released that the smiley face graffiti at some of the crime scenes was considered possibly related and potentially a signature of the killer or killers. Now, the theory really kind of started taking shape in April of 2004 with the drowning of a 21-year-old athlete and student from the University of Wisconsin in La Crosse. That was kind of the tipping point for the town from kind of following along and believing that these were accidents and more so homicides. Now, keep in mind, there was about five or six other drownings prior to this guy's that already had the town kind of up and at it about it like they just were like this shit ain't right like i get this is a partying town it's a college town but like there's shit's not adding up so with that no i don't like that so the tipping point was in april of 2004 however we're gonna actually begin a little bit before that we're gonna travel back to 1997 where this all started to happen now Accidental drownings in college towns is not something out of the realm of possibility. Uh, It had been happening in this town as early as the 70s that I could find. However, most of them were kind of pretty much cut and dry, clearly accidental. Somebody just drank too much, partying, fell in the water, and that was that. But by the time 1997 rolled around, things started to kind of become a little bit more apparent. And that started with our first victim, Richard Lavatley. Richard was a 19-year-old from Western Springs, Illinois. At the time of his death, on July 11th, 1997, Richard came to La Crosse, Wisconsin, to visit his brother, James. James was living in La Crosse at the time. It wasn't stated, but I think he was there for school, being that the school is known for having, like, three three or four colleges within like a five mile radius of each other but yeah so on july 11th richard heads over to uh lacrosse to go visit his brother james they make the decision to go out and drink that night they head to a bar on the corner of pearl and third street they're out having a good time enjoying drinks being social when for unknown reasons an altercation of some sort begins to occur with a group of men and the brothers at this bar. The brothers were then subsequently chased from the bar area where they ran several blocks before they dead-ended at the Mississippi River, which is maybe, I want to say, like two or three blocks from where they were at. It wasn't a far run. As they reached the dead end at the river, they realized that these guys were still following them. Like, they weren't going to lose them. So the decision was made to jump in the water in an attempt to get away from them. These men proceeded to throw fist-sized rocks at both of the guys while they were in the water. Like, concrete rocks and shit just throwing them at these guys. I don't know why. I don't know what happened to make them so pissed. It's never really stated But yeah, they were pissed to the point where they chased them several blocks before continuing to throw rocks at them after they jumped in the water. By this point, the uh, chasers decided to kind of give up. They turned around and they headed back to wherever they came from. James, luckily, was able to swim to safety, but within minutes, he had realized that his brother Richard wasn't so lucky. Richard's body was found two days later in the Mississippi River. His cause of death was ruled as a drowning. However, the manner of death was undetermined with foul play suspected. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with the difference between cause of death and manner of death, manner of death is usually always one of four options. It's either homicide, suicide, accidental, or undetermined. The first three are self-explanatory. The fourth obviously being when the situation calls that the evidence does not make it clear enough what manner it was. 
that can always be changed, of course, when more evidence is received or the investigation closes and they come to a determination as to what happened here. Cause of death is usually just the type of death. Were they shot? Were they stabbed? Did they have a heart attack? In this case, he drowned. Now, the foul play that was suspected was something along the lines of maybe reckless homicide or manslaughter. However, the group of men that did chase them that evening were never identified or charged. They never came forward and nobody was able to identify them. At the time of autopsy, uh, Richard's body was noted to have injuries that he did sustain. However, none of them were life-threatening or considered an aid in his death. They also performed a blood alcohol content test, at which point it came back at 0.271, which is considered almost three times the legal limit. Sadly, this is pretty much an open and shut case for Richard. The town, while finding it heartbreaking and sad, to say the least, they felt that this kind of was an open and shut accidental drowning, being that the guys that did chase him, while maybe meaning to cause harm or, you know, to kick the crap out of the guys, there was, they didn't feel that there was any intention of killing anybody that night. Now, the second victim was named Charles Blatz, and his death occurred a little over two months after Richard's. So Charles Blatz was a 28-year-old University of Wisconsin Platteville student. He wasn't actually a native to La Crosse. He was from Keele, Wisconsin, which was, I believe, a neighboring city. Hope I said that right. Um, he was a military veteran, and he was working towards getting his mechanical engineering degree. He came to La Crosse on September 28, 1997, for their Oktoberfest celebration. Apparently, lacrosse is extremely well known for their Oktoberfest celebration, which, if any of you have celebrated Oktoberfest, you know it's shit ton of beer, maybe some pretzels and cheese, some dudes in some short shorts with a, those long recola horn things. It's a lot of fun. But anyway, lacrosse was known for this. People anywhere within the, the relative area knew lacrosse was where you wanted to be for Oktoberfest. So Charles was just like the rest of them. He wanted to come to celebrate. So that night, Charles was hanging out with some friends who also traveled to lacrosse to celebrate Oktoberfest. He was last seen by his friends around midnight in the area of Sneakers Bar, which is located, or was, I don't think it's standing anymore, maybe, but was located near Pearl and 3rd Street, which is pretty much the same exact area where Richard and his brother James had been drinking just a few months prior. Sneakers Bar at the time was known for their drink specials. They had really cheap alcohol and very cheap prices, so the place was probably usually packed. Um, shortly after the Sneakers Bar, he did head towards a different bar, which was 100 feet away, called Happenings. And that's essentially the space between Sneakers and Happenings Bar is where his friends last spotted him around midnight. Sadly, Charles was not seen alive after that. His body was found five days later on October 3rd, 1997, after a fisherman had spotted it near the 7th Street Landing Bridge. 7th Street Landing is about 1.3 miles away from... Charles's last known location, so completely walkable, drunk or sober, in my opinion. Charles was missing one sock and one shoe, and he was severely mutilated with a fractured skull, and he was missing a damn arm. That terrified me when I first read it. I was like, what the fuck happened to this dude? But I kept reading. Now, the medical examiner did find tissue hemorrhaging. Sorry, no, they didn't. The ME didn't find tissue hemorrhaging. That would suggest he had been alive during any of the trauma with his head and his arm. Being that there was no tissue hemorrhaging, they chalked it up to A, an accidental drowning, 
with the injuries occurring after death when he was most likely struck by barge, which is like a smaller river boat, I guess. I picture like the ones that carry trash, but it didn't state it was a trash barge. It just said it was a barge. They also performed a blood alcohol content test on him, and there were differing um, reports on what those results were. One said it was 0.20, the other one said it was 0.31. Either way, we average him out, and he was over the legal limit, so he was intoxicated at the time of his death. Now, my first thought was, okay, we got two dudes that just happened to just stumble into the river one night. Like, I... I mean, I don't live near a river, but I find I found it really difficult to believe that like there wasn't like security guards or something nearby that could stop this. So I decided to look it up. Uh, it's not like that at all. It seems like pretty much every public access to the river is completely just you could step out of your vehicle, walk 50 feet and you're in the fucking river. There's no gates. There's no fencing. It's just wide open. So it made a little more sense why this was possibly happening. Which brings us now to victim number three. Victim three was Anthony Skifton, who went by the name Tony for short. Now, the interesting thing about Tony's disappearance is that he went dis- he went missing three days. No, oh, excuse me. He went missing two days after Charles's body was found, at least according to some reports which I found very eerie. But anyway, Tony Skifton was a 19-year-old guy from La Crosse. He lived in the town at that time. He was last seen by his friends leaving a party on the night of October 5th. His body was found five days later in Isle La Plume Slope, which is like a sublet of the Mississippi River. His autopsy revealed no foul play, but, quote, acute alcohol intoxication, end quote, was ruled as contributing factor in his death. Officials essentially concluded he most likely fell off of land, wherever he had been standing, and accidentally drowned. They found him with his zippers, his zipper down and with an empty bladder. And kind of just assumed that he must have been walking along, felt the urge to take a leak, saw the river, felt, why not? Let me walk over to it real quick, piss real quick, and something bad happened. There were eyewitnesses in this case, though. One of which was a truck driver who claimed that at 3 a.m. the night that Tony went missing, he saw a man that matched Tony's description walking towards Huska Park which happens to be where his body was found, carrying a case of beer. Another man allegedly came forward to state that several hours after Tony was last seen, this guy gave a ride to two suspicious men in their 20s, one who was actually bleeding from his fucking head. They were leaving Huska Park, and offered him five dollars if he would give him a ride out of the way, out of there. He says after he drove, after dropping them off, he drove back and was quote propositioned by a man with a black goatee. That's literally all it said. So I am. If I was an investigator on this case, I would have been a little confused. So I have a body wash ashore. That has no trauma whatsoever. All signs point to them being intoxicated, heading towards the river to pee and falling in and subsequently drowning. But then I get this guy calling in saying, hey, I was near where this body was found and I gave two guys a ride out of the place, one of which was bleeding from his damn head. Then I decided to come back, and I was propositioned by a man in a black goatee. What am I supposed to do with that fucking information? Anthony was fair-haired. He had, like, either 
blonde or like light brown hair. The pictures I saw, he didn't have a black goatee. So I'm curious as to what the fucking relevance was. But nonetheless, this was included as a potential eyewitness account. I don't know if the eyewitness account was supposed to be the bleeding head guy, even though Anthony wasn't beaten in any way or injured, or if it was supposed to be the guy that was propositioned for sex by some black goatee fucker walking around in the park. Either way, I guess you need to throw it in there. What did stand out, though, was that Anthony's family found it hard to swallow the idea that their son would even go anywhere near the lake, or the river, uh, drunk or sober, considering he had a huge fear of water and didn't know how to swim. I could get on board with that. I myself have a huge fear of water, and I also myself have been drunk many a times. And I can tell you, on all occasions of being drunk, never once when I felt I needed to urinate did I think, let me go find a large body of water and pee in it. It, had, it has always been shrubbery. Hell, I would pee on the side of the road before I went anywhere near a large body of water intoxicated to take a piss. That's just me, though. But I can understand why his family would be like, nah... He wouldn't do that. So that was kind of like the beginning of the, hmm, are you sure this was an accident sort of situation? But regardless, the case was closed and considered accidental, and that was that. Moving forward, though, that brings us to victim number four. Victim number four was named Nathan Catfer. Nathan was a 20-year-old student on an academic scholarship from Viterbo University in La Crosse. He was originally from Glendive, Montana. However, he had transferred there that previous fall and was currently on the baseball team as a star pitcher. According to witnesses, Nathan was at a party Saturday evening with teammates and friends. He left the party rather early, not to drunk, left his car parked, and went on foot. Hours later, Around bar closing time, a bar manager said Nathan came in looking for a drink and was refused service. He became upset, was making a scene, and was let outside. Police were then called. Nathan was seemingly not making a scene anymore at that time. They gave him a breathalyzer. They put him in the car, drove down the street, dumped him at the corner, gave him four citations, and they were on his way. their way. Afterwards, he was briefly seen by friends heading back towards the direction of the bars that he had just come from, and he was subsequently never seen again. Now, just for a little more in-depth on his case, let me go over here. Okay. Now, Nathan was a very well-rounded student and an athlete. He graduated third in his class in high school. He finished second in state as a safety slash wide receiver for his senior year. I don't know if those are the same positions or not. Forgive me. I feel like they're not. So it's kind of impressive that he finished second in both positions. I don't know. He coached Glendive American Legion Baseball for two seasons before he transferred to lacrosse. He was a member of the National Honor Society, which is also how he received his scholarship. As I mentioned before, he was a pitcher for the Viterbo College he was attending. He loved his family and friends very much, and he was a huge sports fanatic. He loved hunting, fishing, and anything outdoorsy. So, on the night of his disappearance, so on the day of his disappearance, Nathan had baseball practice from noon to 4 p.m. on February 21st, 1998. He told friends about a party that he was planning on attending later that day, located at 207 South 9th Street. Now, Nathan does, in fact, arrive at the party, and he's actually one of the first people to arrive at the party at about 6 p.m. 
Many witnesses there claimed he DJed the party, which was only about maybe 40 or 50 people, which still seems kind of big for a house party. Uh, he was also stated to only have had maybe a few beers at most, but he was certainly not drunk at that party. Now, later on, the lieutenant who ends up working his case does interview one of Nathan, Nathan's friends named Keith, as well as others who were there at the party that night. They stated that Nate left the party around sometime between 11 and 11.30 p.m., and that he walked down the street towards his usual hangout, the library bar. Now, the library bar is going to be coming up pretty, pretty often here. So just keep that in mind. So about 12 a.m. or midnight, he was seen at the bar with some friends from a, it's not a basketball team. I'm assuming it was the basketball team at the college that he went to that he probably was friends with. Uh, the reports also stated that he had had three Long Island iced teas, which if any of you know what those are, they've got four shots in them each. On top of the three Long Island iced I can't talk. Is <laughs> on top of the three Long Island iced teas, he also had two additional sh shots. Essentially indicating that he was pretty inebriated at this point. He stayed at the library until 1.30 a.m., where he was then off with some people to go to Brothers Bar and Grill. Now, Brothers Bar and Library Bar are co-owned by, in fact, two brothers. So, also keep that in mind. Surveillance at Brothers Bar catches him stumbling in at last call, which is around 1.30 a.m., Shortly after arriving, though, he is also seen leaving. Witness reports state that he was denied drinks by the bartender and was escorted out after stumbling around, mixing up his school ID with his driver's license, and essentially dry heaving at the bar. The bartender took this as, and that dude, you're good, here's some water. He didn't want water, that upset him a bit, at which point that's when he called to the, uh, Bouncer over, the bouncer escorted him outside of the building where Nate proceeded to make an obscene gesture at his crotch to the bouncer, as well as cussing up a storm. At that point, the police were called to kind of step in and handle the situation. Police arrived on scene at about 1.42 a.m. at Brothers Bar. They find Nathan there, seemingly acting not as drunk as he was described by other witnesses. They find two identification cards on him, one being his school ID and the other not being his at all, but rather a friend's that he had borrowed and was using in order to get into the bar and to order alcohol. At this point, they decide to administer a breathalyzer. The readings state that Nathan's blood alcohol content on that scene at that time was 0 0.077, which is under a legal limit and essentially indicating that he is fine. They hand over four citations to him, however, underage drinking, disorderly conduct, false ID, and being in a bar underage. Afterwards, he's cut loose at the corner of 2nd Street and Pearl Street, which is maybe a block away at most. The police state that they see him head east on Pearl, literally back in the direction that he came from at Brothers Bar. Later on, though, investigators do find out that Nate ran into a few friends at the corner of 3rd and Pearl near Coconut Joe's. Nathan does not mention the citations, uh, and his friends state, that they last see him heading north on 3rd Street from Pearl at about 2.30 a.m.-ish. He's never seen alive again after this point. Fast forward to one day later on February 23rd, 1998. Everybody who pretty much knows Nate realizes that he hasn't come home from the party. He hasn't come home from being downtown. 
and people start to get a little concerned. They notify the police and they begin to essentially search for him around town just to make sure he's not passed out behind a dumpster or whatever the case may be. Of the uh, fellow searchers, the baseball team in which Nate played for at the college decide to join in and essentially help look for him. One of his fellow baseball teammates comes across Nate's baseball cap, wallet, and keys, as well as his four citations he received that night. These items were found in Riverside Park, which is a few blocks west of the centralized bar area where he was last seen. Um, the park has river access. It also has giant statues, benches. It's the fucking park. Uh, but his items were found on the north end near one of their well-known statues of Chief Hiawatha. Now, near this statue, there is actually uh, like a, a docking station for river cruises, as well as a floating gift shop that corresponds with this cruise line. His stuff was neatly folded and placed on the outside deck on the south end of the gift shop floating in the river. The findings of his stuff in this particular area, in this particular fashion, are odd to me. Initially, it actually wasn't, but curiosity got the better of me, and I decided, why not Google Maps this? I did so, and after looking at that and hearing about the way he was acting that night, I, I felt it was just strange. But we'll get into that a little bit further. So police took one look at where his stuff was placed and they concluded that there was only three ways that Nate would have been able to access this particular spot to place his items there. Now, Route A was accessible from the north end of the Riverside Park. It was a ramp that led from land to the north end deck of the gift shop that was blocked off by a single waist-high ramp gate. After jumping over that gate, he would go down the ramp, he would be on the north end deck. He would then have to find a way to get on top of the gift shop because the gift shop does not have pedestrian walkways on either side to make it plausible to reach the south end deck. The only way to reach the south end deck is to either go above the gift shop or through the gift shop. And being the time of night that Nate went missing, the gift shop was not open. So he only had one way, and that was up. So Route A required him to jump over that waist-high ramp gate, go down the ramp, find a way to scurry up on top of the gift shop, cross over the gift shop roof, and then jump down subsequently onto the south end deck and place his stuff there. While it did seem somewhat probable, the police had to factor in the fact that he had been drinking that night, and given the fact that he would have had to hop the gate and then climb up to a roof and then jump down, it just did not seem like something an intoxicated man would be able to do without some sort of injuries occurring. So then they moved on to Route B. Route B was even more unlikely because it was literally a straight across swim from land through the river against the southern current to get to the south end deck of the gift shop. Now, the reason why they ruled this out was that all of Nate's belongings that were found, the baseball cap, the wallet, and the four paper citations he received from police showed zero signs of water damage. They had not been in the water. Obviously, Nate didn't fucking throw them across the fucking river so that they would land there and then he just swam. So being that they were not wet or showed any signs of previously being wet, they ruled that route out pretty quickly. Which pretty much left them with Route C as their only option. Now, Route C was also another ramp leading down towards a floating platform. However, it didn't require him to jump on top of a roof of any sort of gift shop. The ramp led from land 
down to a floating platform, the floating platform being completely empty and flat. You would cross that to the other ramp that connected to the south end deck. This seemed the most plausible, despite him needing to hop over to waist-high ramp gates. Considering his other options, this seemed like it was the only plausible one. Police then moved on to collecting video footage from the night that he went missing. So, given eyewitness accounts, police knew that Nate had visited at least two bars for sure that night, both being the library and Brothers Bar. Now, as I mentioned before, both bars were co-owned by two brothers named Ed and Matt. So, three days after Nathan went missing on February 25th, Lieutenant Romer, in charge of the investigation, decides to go meet with Ed to secure the video footage from Brothers Bar. Brothers Bar, again, being the last bar that Nate was known to visit that night, the one that he got kicked out of, and the police were subsequently called on him. The lieutenant is able to get the footage, and he confirms that the footage does state everyone's accounts of what happened that night to be true. You see Nate come in the bar, stumbling at about 1.30 a.m., he goes over to the bartender. He requests drinks where he is then denied. He's given water. Uh, he starts dry heaving where he is subsequently led out of the bar by the bouncer. All within a couple of minutes. However, the video surveillance footage from the library, which was the bar he had visited prior to heading to Brothers, is not even attempted to be collected until 10 days later, at which it had already been recorded over. This bothered a lot of people because A, the brothers owned both bars, and given that the video surveillance was already collected from one of the bars three days after he went missing, why was the other footage not collected as well at that time was it a communication error between the brothers between the police and the brothers or did the police just forget there doesn't seem to be any explanation regarding this now it sounds like a bit of a fuck up on both ends i mean if you're out collecting evidence video surveillance in particular and you know he's been to two bars, why not just go to the other fucking bar? Or for that matter, why not just ask the brother you're already talking to who has handed over video evidence, hey, while you're at it, can you also collect the video footage from the other bar that you own? Seems easy enough, right? Why do you wait 10 days? Also, if it's on the brother's end, brother A, wouldn't he go, hey, look, dude, we just had the police come in, that missing kid, they wanted video surveillance because he's known to be at both of our bars. Can you collect that other video footage and, you know, set it aside for when they come and collect it? Like, why was none of this done? Honestly, I don't have the answers, guys. I don't know. But moving forward, police also received two calls regarding alleged sightings of possibly Nate from the night he disappeared. One of the guys was interviewed on February 25th, which was also the three days later. This guy said that at about 1 a.m., he was driving home when he spotted a white male, early 20s, in a green shirt, standing at the east side of the bridge at the 700 block of North 3rd Street, pretty much just staring out at the water, completely unaware of his surroundings, kind of just, you know, zoned the fuck out. Considering the description and the time of night that was given, police felt that this could very well be Nate, so they decided to compare the witnesses timeline to the established timeline that they had for Nate that night. So the police knew that sometime between 12.45 and 1 a.m., Nate had mentioned to his friends at the library that he needed to pee, but he subsequently never came back to the table and left the bar where he headed then to Brothers Bar shortly before 1.30 a.m. The witness claims that he saw the guy at the bridge at about 1 a.m. 
Now the distance from the library to the spotting at the bridge is 1.2 miles and it takes about 20 minutes to walk one way. So in order for this sighting to in fact be him, he'd have to run there, like sprint his ass there, stop, zone out long enough for this guy to drive by and be like, huh, this dude's just zoned out. And then run back, drunk, mind you, in enough time to be walking in the door at Brothers, fumbling and sloppy and shit for this to be him. This also required both witnesses of the victim and the guy that saw him at the bridge to be accurate with their time frames, which is actually a very hard thing to do. So given that, a lot of people believe that whoever was staring out into the nothingness on that bridge that night was not Nate. The second potential sighting, though, came from a man named Tim, who called in and was interviewed the day before, on February 24th. Tim said that at about 6 a.m. on February 22nd, he encountered a young white male near a local convenience store located at 1333 Rose Street. He said that the guy was blitzed out of his goddamn mind and mumbled his name to the extent of something similar to Jason. He said they chatted for a few minutes before heading south towards a Hardee's restaurant, a.k.a. Carl's Jr. for you West Coasters. Tim says that he saw Jason struggle his way into the restaurant before departing. So, Lieutenant follows up with Tim's statement by heading down to the Hardee's, and he subsequently interviewed the three employees there that same day. Nothing more is really made mentioned in regards to this sighting at Hardee's. However, Gannon analyzes the distance as his way of kind of trying to rule it out himself to see if it was in fact Nate. He states that from where Nate was last confirmed to be seen on the corner near Coconut Joe's by his friends to the convenience store on Rose Street was a little over two miles one direction. Which is obviously easily doable within the time frame he had, which was 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. But according to the witness, Tim, this guy was hammered. So if it was Nate, he would have had to have obtained much more alcohol after 2 a.m. With the citations for the invalid ID and the underage drinking, I'm not sure if police actually confiscated the ID, but for argument's sake, if they had, he definitely would have no way of buying alcohol for the rest of the evening. Um, a lot of people said that Nate probably would have been really upset about the citations, therefore leading them to believe he wouldn't attempt to continue to buy alcohol that night. Either way, it's safe to say that he would have had trouble buying alcohol after the citations. Being the case, a lot of people felt that this probably wasn't Nate. Also, Jason, Nathan, while I feel sound very similar when mumbled and possibly drunk, a lot of people felt like it just wasn't a close enough comparison of a name for it to actually be him. Now, in the book, Case Studies in Drowning Forensics, they also make mention of a police report that was filed by one of Nate's friends named Mark for the night of Nate's disappearance. Mark says that he was there at the library and recalls Nate arriving that evening. He said that after he saw Nate leave with people to go to Brothers, he himself left the library at about 1.40, 1.45 a.m.-ish, which coincides with roughly the timeline that was established, and he subsequently began walking home. Mark says that when he reached the corner of 5th Street and King Street, he suddenly was aware of a dark-colored, maybe navy blue or black, smallish pickup truck with one of those snug-top, creepy camper-type things that lay over the bed of the truck. He says the truck was beat-up shape and was not a looker, to say the least. However, he felt that it was following behind him rather slowly. He said that he glanced over his shoulder and at the vehicle and was able to make out a single passenger inside in the driver's side. 
He also said that sitting on the dashboard was something that resembled either a citizen's band radio, which I had to look up because I had never heard of that shit in my entire life, which is essentially a truck radio with the walkie-talkie in the box. Mark says it was either something like that, or maybe possibly a radar detector or a police scanner. Either way, something of that nature, it looked like that. Now, ironically, this same description of this vehicle comes up in a later drowning case the following year. So, also keep that in mind. Anyway, so he notices this vehicle following him. He takes note and continues on down King Street, approaching 6th Street, when suddenly the truck pulls in front of him and into the parking lot of a Wells Fargo on his right-hand side. This Wells Fargo does have one of those drive through ATMs. So Mark says that the vehicle hangs a right into the parking lot, goes straight through the ATM, then makes a fucking U-turn and comes out the other end on the other side of the ATM and then comes back out onto King Street and continues in the direction he was going, where he then stops at the stop sign up ahead and sits there as if he's just waiting for Mark to catch up to him. Mark, at this point, thinking the guy is going to fucking snatch him and chop him up into little pieces, decides to turn and run south down 7th Street. Thankfully, this is the last time that Mark sees this truck. However, it was noted that at the time of this spotting, Mark was heading in the direction of the party that Nate had attended earlier that night. He was just a few blocks away, and he was coming from the direction of Nate's last known location. Now, sadly... 41 and a half days later, on April 4th, 1998, Nate's body was discovered. Now, there was differing information on where the body was recovered from, and I'll go over that right now. So, essentially, there was three accounts of where the body was located. Account 1 came from Report A, which stated that the body was found just outside the main channel of the Mississippi River, south of the Bayside Condominiums which is roughly four miles from where his belongings were found in Riverside Park. Account 2 comes from Report B, which states that his body was found in a gravel pit and running slow. They don't give an exact location or street like number or anything like that, which is roughly four and a half miles from his belongings. Ironically enough, this is the same exact location where the next victim is found a year later. Now, account three comes from the medical examiner's report, which states that the body was found near the 3200 block of East Avenue South behind the Dairyland Power Co. This places the body at three and a half miles from his belongings. Now, overall, it is a general area that is well within a mile of each other, but the fact that there was inconsistencies in the exact location, all from police reports and or medical examiner's reports, is just really fucking weird in my opinion. I don't understand why it would be that inconsistent. But moving on, reports stated that he was found with his head and shoulders above the waterline, but with his body submerged under. He wasn't tangled in any debris, but was more pressed up against debris that was gathering in this particular area. And the current was essentially what what was keeping him pushed up against it. He was found wearing his green logo t-shirt and white undershirt, which is the same shirt that his friends and witnesses saw him wearing the night he disappeared. He was taken out of the water at about 5.30 p.m. ish, where he should have then had an initial assessment from a representative from the medical examiner before being transported to the morgue for an official autopsy. Now, this initial assessment that he was supposed to have did not happen on scene, or it should have. He did not receive his initial assessment until he arrived at the morgue that same day. So, that day, the initial assessment pretty much went over basic observations, such as the clothing he was wearing, uh, whether he was male or female, his race, age, the condition of his clothing, personal effects, things of that nature. They also went over physical damage to the body, if any, was seen. They covered the decomposition presence uh, and the bugs, bloat, anything like that. They also covered alger, rigor, and liver mortis. 
all of which are the temperature of the body, the rigidity of the body, and the blood pooling in the body. Now, some of the specifics that were recorded at this time were that, again, they confirmed the clothing he was wearing. They gave a very vivid description of his personal effects on him, which included, I think, two rings that he had on and like a, a braided chain necklace. Uh, they stated that he was covered in mud, sand, and small insects. That he was frozen solid and did express bloating with signs of, quote, marbling, which occurs usually somewhere between 72 and 96 hours in the water. It's that usual green, black, blue, veiny look you see on dead bodies. Degloving was found on hands and torso. However, none was mentioned on the lower extremities, which did seem odd to uh, Kevin Gannon. Now, degloving is just a term used for skin slippage, which is after a body dies, your skin detaches from the muscle layer beneath it and starts displaying like a sagging like slipping off the bone type of look it's actually really fucking gross but it's very common um in decomposition and like they mentioned they saw it in his hands they saw it in his torso but for some reason it was not found in the legs and a lot of studies actually state that it actually begins in the legs i don't know if that's 100 percent true i'm not an expert but it would be weird if that is true that none was expressed in his lower body so fast forward to two days later on April 6th at about 9 a.m., a medical examiner, Lindsay Thomas, walks into the morgue. Now, this is the first time she has seen Nate's body because she was not there on the scene when his body was recovered. She walks in expecting to be able to perform the autopsy on his body for that day. However, after being stored for two days in the regular refrigerator at the morgue in his body bag, she opens the door to find that he is still frozen. Now, being that he's frozen, she's not able to cut into him and begin the process. So she makes the decision to leave his body out in the room temperature of the morgue to thaw for an additional 25 hours. She arrives the next day, April 7th at 10 a.m., and she is able to then proceed with the autopsy. She begins the autopsy by reiterating the personal effects and clothing. She compares dental x-rays to Nate's known records of dental x-rays and confirms that it is him. Now she does go over rigor mortis, which again is the stiffness found in dead bodies. You know, when their arms are like stuck in a weird position, like you can't bend the shit out of them. They're just stiff. Now rigor mortis usually begins... Anywhere between 24 and 36 hours when a body is found on dry land. At which it does cycle through. So rigor mortis doesn't last forever, guys. It starts, it lasts for a little while, and then it recedes and is gone. And a body is then bendable again. Now, the book stated that it does take twice as long for rigor mortis to go through its full cycle when a body is found in water. That somewhat makes sense to me. Being that they're in water, you know, shit always gets more mushy when it's in water. It makes sense that, you know, the process would take a little longer. The book states that it takes about 72 hours to fully complete the beginning, middle, and end of rigor mortis. Now, at the time of the autopsy, she states that the rigor mortis had completely cycled through. And that did seem consistent with him being missing and presumed dead for, again, 41 days. Next thing she went over was liver mortis, which is the blood pooling. Now, by that I mean when somebody dies, their heart stops pumping blood. Blood begins to just kind of fall into place due to gravity now if a person say for example dies on their back all of that blood due to gravity is going to pool at their back which over a course i think of 10 to 12 hours is when it fully sets in at which point you could then move the body and the blood does not move and you will find 
large, bright red splotching covering the entire area where the blood had pooled. Now, the same thing would happen if they died on their stomach. It would be on their stomach. If they died on their side, it would be all along their side and possibly an arm if they were laying on an arm. But you get what I'm saying. Now, the medical examiner could not determine the location of lividity or liver mortis, which indicated that it's possible that during the time frame when liver mortis would set in, his body had been moved repeatedly so that blood didn't have a chance to actually pool. Now, decomposition in bodies on land versus water have a one to two ratio, meaning that if the average signs of decomposition in a body that is dead on land takes, let's say for this example, 24 hours, it would be equivalent to a body dead in the water for 12. Now this is decomposition and not rigor mortis. Decomposition is allegedly twice as fast in water according to this book. Anyway, with that said, and factoring everything in, the medical examiner's opinion was that it had been deceased and decomposing for up to 72 hours. Now, obviously, we all know he had been missing for far longer than that, but because he was found frozen, that essentially explained why he wasn't decomposing further than that. However, being that he was frozen, this shortens the possible window. So if his body has signs of decomposition that is consistent with up to 72 hours post-mortem on land, but he was found in water, that would make the range between 36 to 72, because we do not know how long he was in the water. That would then mean that either it was the full 72, at which point he was put in the water, or it was somewhere between the 36 and 72, at which point he was put into the water, which then stopped the process. And again, this is all assuming that the water is what froze him, but there's something about that we're going to get into later as well. Now, the ME also noted that there were these pink marks on the tips of Nate's fingers that were strange and not something she had ever seen before. There was no real explanation for these marks. She found two bruises on his left leg as well. Now, they weren't anything super serious. They were small and superficial injuries that could have come from anything, but what was stated was that they did happen prior to his death. They were not post-mortem bruising. Now, Gannon, given all of this information, believes that Nate was murdered and that the proof lies with the rigor mortis, or lack thereof in this case, and the analysis that he did of weather and water temps based on the last 10 days before Nate was found. And here's the theory. As previously mentioned, Nate was frozen solid the day he was found on April 4th. It took three days to thaw him out, two of which were spent in refrigeration, and the last, plus one hour, were spent at room temp. But essentially, it took him three days to thaw the fuck out and to be able to have an autopsy. The fact that rigor mortis had been since gone and passed before he was frozen, an analysis of those days suggested that the water and weather were not cold enough to freeze his body completely solid. Gannon concluded that the only way Nate could have cycled through rigor mortis and then been frozen completely, showing no signs of it afterward, was that Nate had to have been dead outside of the water for about 24 to 36 hours so that rigor mortis could set in and relent, at which point he was then frozen, stopping the decomposition process. But the manner in which he was frozen had to have been essentially a deep freeze for him to be solid as a fucking rock. He wasn't partially frozen, guys. The guy, you could knock on him. That's how frozen he was. He believes that Nate was kept in a deep freeze of sorts and was then removed and placed into the water sometime within 24 hours of being found. Now, initially, I was like, what the fuck? But if you do take 
weather analysis and water temperature analysis and you compare the conditions of the time frame that he was missing if in fact those state that there's no way a body could have been frozen to the extent that he was there has to be an alternative explanation right how does a body become frozen solid if temperatures don't allow it there has to be an outside factor i found that to be interesting now, aside from the location of the body being unclear, there was another inconsistency, and that was in the clothing that was reported to be worn by Nate that night. Now, eyewitnesses at the party, eyewitnesses of his at the bar, and the autopsy report all stated that Nate was seen wearing a green logo t-shirt that kind of like mimicked a Gatorade. It was like a meme of a Gatorade logo but it said get laid which i thought was kind of funny um he had that green shirt on he had a white undershirt on everybody who saw him physically that night and the medical examiner all state that's what he was wearing however if you remember the police intercepted him at about 1 42 a.m that night and gave him the four citations now, when they do that, they do have to fill out a report. They put in a description of the person that they are writing the citations for. Now, in that description, they state that Nate is wearing a long sleeve brown shirt with a white undershirt. I, I don't know how um, colorblind works. I don't know if green can be confused with brown. I don't know if it can't be. But they took the information that they put on the report, and that's actually the information they released um, when they sent out, like, the bulletin when he was missing and searching for him. So it does seem kind of odd that the police have his listed as brown, yet he's found in green, and everybody who saw him that night said he was wearing green. So another minor inconsistency. They also tried to play out the theory that, hmm, well, you know, his car was parked several blocks away, did he have enough time between, you know, being sighted and then running into people that saw him wearing the green shirt to go change him? They worked it out. He didn't have time. And he also wasn't seen wearing or carrying an extra shirt with him. It, it just, there was no extra shirt found in his vehicle. Like this weird brown shirt only the police saw has not resurfaced. Nobody knows where the fuck it came from. Anyway, moving forward, uh, toxicology tests were performed on Nate as well at the time of his autopsy. They came back stating that not only was his blood alcohol content level that of 0.22, which is a vast jump from the 0.07 he had at the time of his citation, but they found, I'm going to butcher the shit out of this, phenethylamine and n propanol in his system now phenethylamine abbreviated as pea is an organic compound that our body can naturally produce in small amounts on its own however it is also known widely and commonly used as a base for a number of things ranging from dietary supplements for mood weight loss, treating depression, treating ADHD, athletic performance. It's also documented as a psychoactive and stimulative, as well as relations to amphetamines, methamphetamines, and MDA, MDMA. Needless to say, this organic compound has a far reach. It, it could go either way. It could be taking your vitamins at home or it could be you raging on mdma at the fucking club we don't really know now and provenol in layman's terms is an alcohol solvent and by alcohol i don't mean a drinking alcohol but more of a dissolving alcohol it seems to be used mostly in cosmetics or Perfumes, flavoring agents, air care products, cleaning products, inks, soaps, you name it. So pretty common items you come in contact with on a regular basis. Some in which you even ingest. I mean, given its presence, it could be harmless or it could be fucking weird and out of place. Now the relativity of both for me is based on the levels found. A wildly excessive amount would present more of an alarm to me rather than trace amounts. However, 
Not knowing makes this slightly irrelevant, in my opinion. Now, fast forward to July of 1999. Bloodhound searches are performed, both on land and on water, via boat. Given the amount of time that has passed, there was skepticism on what the results would be, but these, this canine actually fucking pulled through. I believe the canine's name was Hoover. Was a good doggy. I wish Hoover was my doggy. So they started the searches via boat. Hoover hit at the gift shop deck where Nate's belongings were found, as well as the side railing and the ramp to the boat, all of which were the suspected route of how his stuff had got there in the first place. The canine, however, indicated trauma, such as a physical altercation or something not good happening near the riverbank, the ramp, and the back deck of the shop. She was able to do this because when physical encounters occur, such as brawls or fights of that nature, people come in contact with each other and they do shed excessive amounts of dead skin cells in that process, making the scent much more potent and stronger to canines and in particular bloodhounds when they are searching for this. They then give a specific indication to that particular find, in which case they call them trauma rolls. However, after this find, they continued down the channel, where the canine also expressed interest at a sandy beach on the opposite side of the river, about 2,500 feet away from the uh, gift shop where his stuff was found. This area was known as Pettibone Park, and it was downstream from the area. Hoover showed zero interest in the Market Street Bridge, which is where potential sightings of Nate had been. She also showed no interest in the Hood Street Bridge as well. Now, Hoover did pick up his scent further down, just behind the 7th Street boat landing. Now, the Seventh Street boat landing is where they had pulled his body out of the water. Even though his b- body was found further south, they had to bring it to that boat landing because it was the closest one in order to be able to bring him out of the water. However, the dog didn't hit on the boat landing. She hit several hundred yards east of it. Now, this area is called Swift Creek, and it is where there's a hit via canine and later on in a separate case of drowning as well. However, at this particular area, the canine sniffed Mark Catfer, which is Nate's father, who was also there assisting with the search, made whimpering sounds and essentially cuddled him. There was no description as to what those indicators mean, but it sounds like it's not good, whatever it is. Now, I made a little note of this because when I'm usually reading out a mapped out area on a case, I like to visually see it so it makes more sense to connect the dots now as i was doing that i noticed literally feet away from this particular area that the dog indicated at there happened to be uh an ice skating rink like an indoor ice arena doesn't mean anything but what popped into my mind at the time was kevin gannon thinks that nate's body had been frozen prior to being put in the water and being found Now, the autopsy makes no mention of him being curled up in a fetal position or a crunched position that would suggest he was put in a freezer, uh, like, at somebody's house, you know, like your deer hunting freezer that has all the deer meat in it in the garage. He's sprawled out full, whole length of him. He's somewhere near, you know, six feet long. And how do you keep somebody frozen fully stretched out? It would have to be like a large freezer, right? I thought it was interesting. It There was no indication of that ice skating rink, but it was something that I noticed and I thought I would throw in there to try to feel smart. Anyway, they proceeded to move to the land tracking after the hit in this location. The Bloodhound was able to track Nate's scent from the library bar to Brothers Bar. However, the scent was then tracked to something police were not aware of. Nate's scent was then picked up at Shooter's Bar. Now, Shooter's Bar is in very close proximation to where 
he was last spotted by his friends at that corner of Coconut Joe's. It literally goes like Coconut Joe's, maybe a small skinny building in between that, and then Shooter's Bar's right next to that. And Shooter's Bar's tiny. It's not a big place, but very close in proximity. And the direction that he was departing from that night, suggested by his friends, state that it's very well possible that he could have walked into Shooter's Bar. However, given that nobody claimed to see him walk into Shooter's Bar that night, no video surveillance or witness accounts were ever confirmed or even collected to state that he had been in Shooter's Bar. But this dog smelled him in there. The canine indicated that he had entered Shooter's from the front door, went out the back and through an alley across the parking lot and then north to Riverside Park by that giant statue and the floating gift shop where his stuff was found. There were no reports that the canine tracked the scent from Coconut Joe's or near where his friends last saw him, but again, it was feet away. It wasn't on the other side of town or anything crazy like that. They were feet away. I can't express that enough. However, when I look at the canine's account, it does make sense, though. Up until this point, Nate's last concern, last confirmed walking north on 3rd, away from Pearl Street. It's very well possible, again, that he was walking towards shooters. I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Now, analysis done of river currents contradicted the belief that Nate fell into or even purposefully entered the water at Riverside Park where his stuff was found. There's no way he could have entered the water there and ended up where his body did south of that area. It would have required him to float against the current for several hundreds of yards, which would be impossible if you're a dead body. Keep in mind, he starts at the north end, is alleged to have drowned and drowning only takes several minutes it wouldn't be several minutes before he reached the channel where it splits off and chose to swim against the current to end up in the fucking channel that he did to end up where he did it would have required him to enter the wa the water much further south than where his belongings were found so to conclude all of this here are the issues that i found one, his belongings found neatly in an area that an alleged stumbling drunk man would have had trouble accessing. I don't know, I, one of the first things that rubbed me wrong were his belongings just being neatly placed on a floating fucking gift shop that's blocked off by gates. It, like, I'm sure he was there, or at least somebody who came in contact with him was there, but it just, I'm not going to lie, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm not going to lie. When I read that his baseball teammate found the items there, I immediately thought, interesting, you just happened to find them there the next day. I mean, even if he didn't touch them, he could have Nate sent on him if he was out drinking with him the night before. It could indicate why the dog picked up on Nate's scent if that guy touched the stuff that was found there. And, you know, I... I don't, you, you get what I'm trying to say. I just, it seemed, I don't picture him putting his stuff there. I'm sure he was in the area, but to climb over the fences and like, it just, uh, moving on. His blood alcohol content at the time of his citations was under the legal limit at 0 0.077, something like that. Yet everyone that saw him, including police, said that he was acting as if he was extremely intoxicated. Like, fumbling drunken dry heaving mess yet he's under the legal limit everybody's tolerance is different of course but now being that his blood alcohol content at topsy at autopsy being three times the legal limit indicating he continued to ingest alcohol well after the citation plus the uh, dog tracking him to shooter's bar an area he was heading towards after his last confirmed sighting by friends of which the scent then tracks into the park after kind of makes me think that maybe this struggle that the dog indicated was a product of somebody that accompanied him to Shooter's Bar that night. It also makes sense why nobody came forward and said they saw them there. This led me to believe that there was a possible outside factor into his death. I don't necessarily believe it's a gang of, you know, serial killers preying on drunk college kids with the intent of drowning them. But I do believe 
he headed to Shooter's Bar after last being seen at 2.30 a.m. by his friends, feet away from there. It just makes sense. I think it's completely possible that he either met up with someone he knew or he bumped into somebody he knew or even met somebody there. They could have been able to continue dr buying drinks for him uh, if he didn't have his ID because the police confiscated it or if he was too shaken up by the citations to want to even attempt at that point. Either way, if he was accompanied by somebody, it would it, it could explain why he was able to continue drinking. They left out the back and towards the park. It would also explain why people didn't see him there. It also could have been in an attempt to avoid possibly being seen by a group of friends. Some sort of altercation could have occurred, which is why the dog indicated it there at the park. However, this is where I get a little conflicted, though. The hit at Petty Bone Beach by the canine feels kind of out of place. My guess would be maybe it's a transfer hit. Like maybe somebody who had come in contact with him had also been at that beach that day and maybe the dog picked it up. I also don't know how I feel about the 7th Street slash Swift Creek hit that the canine picked up on as well. It's not necessarily where they found his body, but it is close to where they had pulled his body out of the water. But again, I did mention the ice rink. That's literally as far-fetched as you could get, but I felt like throwing that in there anyway. I do believe someone is at fault for his death. A gang of serial drowners? Eh, probably not. But I do think it could have been someone Nate knew on a very basic level, at minimum. And that he felt comfortable enough to be around them. He didn't have any defensive wounds on him or serious injuries. Yeah, that could have been alcohol-related. He just wasn't quick to defend himself. But again, I think he just had to be with someone. His stuff being creepily placed in such a weird area suggests to me that it wasn't him who actually put it there. Regardless, the case was ruled a death by drowning. The manner does remain undetermined. Now, everything stayed relatively calm until about a year, a little less than a year later, when our fifth victim occurred. Now, our next victim... Victim number five was named Jeffrey Giese. According to case studies in drowning forensics, 20-year-old Jeff began April 10th, 1999, which was a Saturday, at Hanson Hall, which my dumbass had no idea what the fuck that was. It turns out it's actually on the campus of the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. So he was a student there living on campus. Anyway, Jeff leaves campus and heads a couple blocks away to a Taco Bell, which I just ate. It's delicious. He heads to the Taco Bell and he speaks with a manager there. Why? I really couldn't tell you. I, uh, I couldn't find any explanation as to why he wanted to speak to the manager the second he walked in the door. My safest assumptions would be that either he was friends with, knew them, or maybe he even worked there and was like just coming in and, you know, shooting the shit in his schedule, whatever the case may be. Again, I can't confirm any of that, but why else do you walk into a Taco Bell randomly to speak to the manager unless you have a complaint? <clears throat> but anyway, he lets the manager know that he's headed to a house party a girl is having on Pine Street, not far from where he's at. But being that he told the manager that, I, I think we can safely assume that they were friends. He leaves the Taco Bell and he walks to the party. He arrives there, and he stays there for a little bit uh, before he decides to leave the party with a said girl, her father of all people, and two other unknown guys he has never met until that very moment named Scott and Bill. Now, this sounds like the weirdest house party I've ever heard of. Like, I, why do you leave the house party to go with the chick who's throwing it and her dad and a couple, a couple of dudes you don't know? I do, okay. But anyway, moving forward, they all head down to State Street and 3rd Street to Big Al's Pizza, right next to, you guessed it, the library. We are all familiar with by this point, at least. The girl's father buys everyone some food and drinks, and they kind of just all hang out and chill there, which, that's super nice of them. By 10.30 p.m., the girl and her father decide to leave, and they head back home. Jeff, however, and his new friends, Bill and Scott, 
head to Bodega Brew Pub, which is about a two-minute walk from the pizza place. Here, the guys introduce Jeff to Steve, also whom he's never met before. So at this point, it is Scott, Bill, Steve, and Jeff. It's about 11.30 p.m. The female bartender at the Bodega Brew Pub later states that she recalls all four men being there that night. She remembers Jeff because she specifically gave him a few free drinks, being that he was short on cash. They stayed there at the Bodega Brew Pub until midnight. Now, this is where things start to kind of fall off the rocker a bit. So guy number three, Steve, says that him, Bill, and Jeff leave Bodega and walk to Club Millennium, which is located literally across the walkway from Big Al's, which was 500 feet away from them where they were earlier. He says they all shared a pitcher of beer. By 1 a.m., he says Bill and Scott started walking home and that Jeff decided to stay at Club Millennium talking to some unknown brunette and that Steve himself decided to leave to the library, which was literally right next door. Bill and Scott claim they couldn't remember what bars they were at that night, uh, but that they do remember that by the time they left, it was heavily raining that night, and that made it harder for them to kind of figure out where they were at and how to get home, considering they were completely smashed. Both do recall, though, that the last time they remember seeing Jeff, he was talking to a small, petite-looking brunette at a bar. Which bar? They don't know, but they remember seeing him talking to a brunette at a bar. Now, these series of events is later doubted after Bloodhound was brought in and was able to track Jeff's scent to the library, but not Club Mun- but not Club Millennium. Now, people living uh, in apartments above Club Millennium were notorious for tossing their private entrance keys to their apartment down to the people on the street level outside the bars inviting them up to continue partying after last call. Now, 43 days later, on May 24th, 1999, Jeff's body is discovered in Running Slow, which is about 3,400 feet south of where Nate's body was recovered the year prior, according to the ME. He was found with a blood alcohol content of 0.42, which is wild as well as 130 micrograms of GHB in his system. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the actual words for that abbreviation, but it is also known as the date rape drug, for those of you who are familiar with that terminology. Now, GHB, in very minuscule doses, can be found in alcohol. So, initially, it wouldn't be crazy to assume that a small amount of what was found in his body occurred from the known drinking he was doing that night, and dude had a fucking point four two blood alcohol content, which is poof. But I decided to kind of look into GHB a little bit further and try to figure out what the average dose is. Therefore, you know, having a better understanding of what's normal and what's not normal. Now, surprisingly, it was actually really hard to find clear answers on this uh but from what i gathered anywhere between one to two grams would be like a prescribed dosage for somebody um depending on body mass and shit like that now excessive amounts would lead to vomiting deliriousness like comatose type sleep things you kind of associate with the date rape drug However, no signs of trauma were noted on Jeff's body. Three days after his recovery is when they decided to bring in canine searches again. Now, the canine that was used was the same one as well as the handler was the same from the Nate Caffers case the year prior. They decided to begin the canine sniffy searches at the University of Wisconsin in La Crosse which is where Jeff had been living. Uh, From there, they were provided a a baseball cap from campus security that was known to belong to Jeff. 
Uh, the dog Sniffy sniffed it, and long story short, with that hat, the canine independently noted several areas within Sanford Hall, which is where Jeff actually lived. Uh, the dog took them up to the second floor area near like a window sill, which we we can only assume Jeff had maybe rubbed up against at some point. Uh, before heading to the third floor, which is where Jeff lived, finding his dorm room, entering, and then indicating which bunk bed was actually his. The dog did this all independently based on the sniffy sniffs he got from the hat. From there, the canine indicated that Jeff was at the library bar. However, there was no indication that he was ever in Club Millennium. Now, in the library bar, he was sniffed in the bathrooms. He was all over the bar area, stools, you know, seating area. He was all over the library, but his scent was, again, not found in Club Millennium. Even in the bathrooms, the dog was able to indicate that there was a possibility that Jeff had been throwing up shortly before closing time, given the areas in which the dog was picking up his scent hitting. So... Make of that what you will. I maybe like vomit on the walls. I don't. I don't know. But the book stated that the dog was able to indicate that there was possibly some vomiting going on in the bathroom. Now the dog was also in, able to indicate that Jeff had been outside of the library, in particular with association to two vehicles, one of which was parked out front, and one that was in the alleyway out back. Now, the front vehicle belonged to a guy named Carl, known to live above the library in those apartments that I mentioned. And he was also known to frequent the library very often. Carl would park his vehicle elsewhere, usually in a parking structure of sorts nearby, until closing time, at which point he would then go and retrieve his vehicle and park it in front of the library. Now, the canine indicated that Jeff had been inside Carl's vehicle. What made this even more interesting, though, was that this vehicle matched the description of the creepy stalker vehicle that followed Nate's friend Mark the night Nate disappeared a year prior. Remember the creepy beat-up truck with the camper top and the fucking 469er radio thing on the dashboard? Yeah, this was pretty much the same truck. <clears throat> now, the other vehicle was a Plymouth minivan parked in an alleyway between Big Al's Pizza and Club Millennium. The van belonged to a brunette divorcee named Karen. Karen also was known to frequent the library. Aside from these vehicles, though, Jeff's scent was then tracked to a parking structure associated to a Holiday Inn one block from the library. The scent indicated that a possible vehicle had parked on the second floor and that Jeff's scent was somehow associated to it. However, no further identification was given in regards to this vehicle. There was no way of confirming if the alleged vehicle could have been Carl's vehicle, who is again known to park his car elsewhere, particularly in parking structures while business hours of the bar were going on. Now, close in proximity to this uh, parking structure, there was vomit found nearby near some bushes uh, that also hit for Jeff's scent. However, none of this vomit was actually collected and tested or even confirmed to be Jeff's via the police, which baffles me if i want just fucking collect it and test it i don't see what the problem is anyway back at the library jeff's scent continued up to the stairway leading to the apartments above the scent couldn't be followed into carl's apartment though due to it being locked at the time of the search but his scent was found in the janitor's trash bins that were locked in the hallway closet his trail led up the stairs down the second story hallway towards a window overlooking the bars down on street level. Uh, it also was associated to the communal bathrooms and down the back stairs and out the back entrance of the apartment building. 
Once it was outside, the canine led via the scent to the alleyway between Big Al's and Club Millennium, crossed the street, went through Shooter's Bar, sound familiar, out the back of Shooter's, past a few alleys, across the street, through a parking lot, towards a Radisson Hotel, around said hotel to Riverside Park, towards the river's edge, stopping briefly at that edge. Now, it is noted that the path from Shooter's was awfully similar to the path indicated for Nate, with the exception of it splitting off once it reached Riverside Park, obviously. In Nate's case, it went a little further north where his belongings were found, This one sounds like it stayed kind of, you know, straight or maybe veered a little more south from that area. After reaching the river's edge, the scent then continued back to the Radisson Hotel parking lot along 2nd Street. Here, a vehicle was indicated to intercept the scent, but that didn't stop the dog from actually continuing to track the scent. Um... The scent did continue south, where Second Street then becomes Front Street, and continued until the Nieldbalski Bridge at Hood Street, which is about 1.3 miles in total. It's the same bridge that um, Tony was uh, located near, if you remember that. Now, here at this bridge, the canine indicated that a trauma of sorts had happened to Jeff here via a trauma roll, the same thing that they did for Nate. Um, This usually indicates that either a fight broke out or some sort of altercation that was traumatic to the victim had taken place at this bridge. Now, that was where the tracking for that particular search ended that day. A second search, however, was conducted almost two months later using the same dog, Mr. Giese, however, Jeff's father, wanted to attend this time as well, but he wanted to test the canine's ability after the prior findings, kind of just as a way to um, validate the dog's ability to track the scent. So what he decided to do was he brought a hairbrush belonging to his son, Jeff, and he decided to double Ziploc bag it, and he handed it to one of the firefighters who was on scene assisting with the search. He told the firefighter to hide the brush. The firefighter decided to tuck the brush underneath his shirt and the sweatshirt and the rubber raincoat that he had been wearing that day. Now, when Hoover the canine arrived on scene, she was once again shared the scent of Jeff and was let free to track it. The dog immediately went to Mr. Giese briefly Afterwards, it found the firefighter, and it jumped up on the firefighter and indicated that the scent was coming from his chest, and what do you know, the fucking hairbrush was in there. This exercise essentially kind of confirmed the dog's capabilities in tracking scent, and everybody there that was on the scene that day was satisfied with the results that they received from that. So with that, they proceeded with the second search, but this time they decided to do it uh, by water on a boat. So they started at Pettybone Beach, and that, again, is about, I think I said 2,000, 2,500 feet south and on the opposite side of the Mississippi River from um, that floating gift shop in Riverside Park. So they started there, and they headed south. Hoover the canine indicated the same Hood Street Bridge that it did in the first search. Same bridge that she had indicated with the trauma roll, indicating that something had really bad happened to Jeff there on that bridge. However, they took note of this, and they did continue on. Uh, The search continued, and the canine was able to bark and indicate for the boat to veer left when the channel began came up to like a split where you could either continue on the main channel or branch off into the side left channel. Um, The dog indicated the side left channel, which leads into running slow, which is what leads to the gravel pit where Jeff's body was found. So they took the path the dog indicated. When they reached the gravel pit, Hoover jumped out of the boat and sat on the gravel pit and subsequently stated that this is where his body had landed. However, that's not where it ended either. 
Hoover then tracked Jeff's scent leaving the pit, which is odd. Usually this wouldn't happen if this is where the body came to its final resting position. However, Gannon suspects that maybe somebody who had come in contact with Jeff left the area, hence the scent kind of whifting along with it. Um, but Kane, the canine was also able to lead the search to a small island nearby that, astonishingly enough, police never released was relevant to the case. Now, the day that Jeff's body was found, he was so, like, wedged into the area that he was at, uh, and it was such a small area that they did, when they finally got him out of it, needed to drag him to a separate island across the way so that they could attempt to bag his body there. Um, this particular area is where Hoover indicated and investigators that were there on the scene were kind of astonished by this because that was not public information. The only people that could have known that were the people that recovered his body that day. That search subsequently ended on that note and a third search was then performed in November, an additional four months later, and altogether six months since his disappearance. Same canine, Hoover, was brought in as well as the same handler. They started at the Hood Street Bridge, where the trauma was indicated, and eventually the scent led them to a hospital south of the bridge, which was in the direction of where the body was found. However, the search did have to end there due to a heavy traffic and lack of police escort. Overall, though, when police were asked by Gannon about the findings of all three searches, they kind of brushed off the uh, canine's findings and said that the dog was a bust and that it subsequently led to nothing helpful, which I think is a load of shit, but it is what it is. Now, during the autopsy... Liver mortis became a bit of an issue. Again, liver mortis is the settling of the blood in the body after death. It usually does take a period of 10 to 12 hours of a body laying in a stagnant position for blood to collect and settle according to gravity, at which point the body then can be moved and the liver mortis markings, the dark red patches on the skin, remain there and they don't fade or anything like that. Now, with Jeff, the medical examiner struggled to identify any real indication of blood pooling or lividity. However, when Gannon inspected the autopsy photos that were provided to him, he indicated that there was potentially lividity found in red areas of the neck and tops of the shoulders, as well as the very top of the back. This led him to consider the possibility of it being lividity and would mean that Jeff would have been in a head down, feet in the air position for a minimum of 10 to 12 hours after dying, if it was in fact lividity that he saw in those photos. Again, he's an experienced, retired uh, homicide investigator. I know he's seen his fair share of lividity in um, corpses. So, I mean, you can't totally discount his theory there however you do also have a medical examiner we don't know her his or her level of experience on the job but i mean it, it's very conflicting there one says i couldn't see it the other one says hey, it's possibly here only it's just a very strange positioning at the time another issue though was rigor mortis the stiffening and subsequent relaxing of the body after death whether on land or water rigor mortis would not be able to be present past 70 to 2 72 hours after death, as previously explained. However, 43 days after Jeff goes missing, he is found with rigor mortis still present in his arms. So much so that he wasn't actually able to be fit properly into a body bag when they recovered his body from the river. His arms were stuck in a raised above the shoulders position. Now, the temperatures of both the weather and the water were not formidable for freezing like they were in Nate's case, even though in Nate's case they weren't formidable to the extent of freezing, they 
could have played a part in some of the freezing of his body. However, none of that was present in this particular case. So if rigor was still active, it possibly indicated that Jeff had been dead for only up to 72 hours prior to finding his body. This led to the possibility that he had been alive, held captive somewhere, and subsequently killed before being put into the water. Now, contents in his stomach were tested and analyzed, and they indicated that he may have had something to eat sometime between four to six hours before dying. It stated that there was some sort of like mucky brown, possibly food or alcohol substance in his stomach. However, uh, there wasn't much in there to begin with, uh, and his gallbladder was also completely empty, which would be odd for the processing of food. Um, there was no large amounts of water in his stomach either, which usually is found in um, drowning victims because they swallow a lot of water in the process of drowning. Um, minimal fluid was found in his lungs. It's not like there wasn't any, but they were surprised at how little was found for a drowning victim, um, which did suggest to them that maybe he was likely unconscious when he entered the water. In conclusion, despite all the law enforcement and Emmys confirming Jeff died on April 10th slash 11th, sometime in the early morning hours between those two days, the level of decomposition to his body did not support death longer than four days. And that was with factoring in weather and water conditions. Now, Gannon and his team actually reached out for outside opinions from pathologists that weren't close to the case, uh, weren't necessarily familiar with it. They provided them photos, uh, particularly the autopsy photos. They provided them the research uh, pertaining to the water and weather reports that they had had. And uh, all of them concluded that this particular body could not have been dead for more than a week at most. Now, something to also take note of, um, he did have the blood alcohol test uh, performed. However, he didn't have it performed in the manner that it's usually done at the time of autopsy. Now, usually autopsies, they take either a sample of your blood, uh, urine, or in some severe cases, they'll even take it from the liquid in your eyeballs. Um, for whatever reason, usually they'll do all three to kind of come out with an average that is the most um, consistent. However, they weren't able to take samples from any of these. Uh, Jeff was found with no urine in his bladder, so they couldn't test that. He, eerily enough, though, was found with little to no blood in his entire body. They were not able to pull a sample from any veins or areas in his body that could produce a large enough sample for a blood alcohol content test to give accurate results. Um, their last resort was the liquid that is found in our eyeballs that can be tested. Yeah, he didn't have any in, in the eyeballs. He had no liquid, which was very odd. Um, usually this is something that you would find like in mummified victims that are you know, completely embalmed and in dry coffins and stuff. This guy was left to decay in a river for over 40 days. And you're telling me he doesn't have any blood or urine or eyeball fluid? Like, I just, this one was, this was a strange one. That one really didn't seem possible. But because he had no fluids to test for the blood alcohol content, that left them with resorting to testing his spleen, which is kind of like the the final test one would do in dire situations. Um, and that's what gave them the 0. 0.42 reading, given that this was a spleen blood alcohol content test. Um, it is possible that his levels could have even been higher than that. Um, something to also consider as well, though, is uh, your body does produce forms of alcohol and fermentation when decomposing, and that too can also potentially affect the results in some manner. 
So it's all stuff to kind of keep in mind with that number 0.42. Regardless, even if you shaved away, you know, room for error and stuff, like that's still a pretty fucking high alcohol content, if you ask me. Now, as far as the GHB that was found in Jeff's system, Gannon in his book provides a chart with ranges and the subsequent effects of that dosage. So it states that if you have 52 micrograms per milliliter or less, that the um, side, like after effects, I guess you could say, would be uh, wakefulness. So you'll actually be alert and kind of, you know, sharpened and aware and whatnot. Now, if you were to up the dosage to anywhere between 52 and 156 micrograms per milliliter, that does induce somewhat of like a light drowsiness or sleep. Um, if you were to up that even further to between 156 and 260 micrograms per milliliter, that would then induce some moderate sleep. So, you know, you'd be tired. You wouldn't be lightly tired. You wouldn't be heavy tired, but you'd be just right tired. Uh, and then lastly, anything over 260 micrograms per milliliter would mimic the effects of a deep sleep or a coma. You know, usually the shit that people hear about when the drug is used um, for date rate purposes. Now, normal amounts, again, are found in the body naturally, and that usually ranges between 5 and 10 micrograms. So shaving that off the amount that was found in him leaves Jeff with a rough estimate of 120 to 125 micrograms per milliliter in his system, um, which would put him in the bracket of side effects of like relatively late sleep. Now, if this was the dosage that he actually ingested, my assumption would be that this was a recreational, most likely knowingly dose. I can't picture someone slipping him this baby dose to a 200 plus pound man in hopes of making him unconscious. Um, unless they just have no idea of what they're doing. However, it should also be noted that it's listed to only have an active uptime of maybe 18 to 60 minutes. Some sources set up to four hours. <laughs> I don't know. Either way, um, if it's only 18 to 60 minutes, that could mean that either a higher dose was given and he either threw up a portion of it, considering that there was indications that he just threw up fucking everywhere that night, um, or that it had already partially been metabolized and had worn off at the time of death. Now... Overall, the circumstances around his death that stand out to me mainly are uh, the canine searches uh, because they confirm known locations Jeff was at that night. Uh, they debunk a few of the strange new friends he made that night, uh, their accounts of what happened. Now, granted, you also have to factor in that they claimed to have been trashed and it's very well possible that they were. Uh, but it sounds like Steve in particular was like dead set on like, nah, dude, we were at the fucking club millennium. He was there. He split a picture of beer with us. He was talking to some brunette. Like the guy's story was like dead set on club millennium. Yet the dog's like, no, he wasn't here. He never came here. So it's just, it's odd. Um, the canine also implicates the vehicles that were involved, one of which eerily matches a description of a creepy vehicle that stalked the friend of our previous victim the night he went missing. Uh, it also indicated an altercation at the bridge, which would coincide with where his body was found. It wouldn't be impossible for his body to have gone over the bridge at that area and to end up at the gravel pit where he was at. It is very well possible that could have happened. Um, however, they do make you kind of question the extent of the movement. He went from the bar to the random parking lots to vomiting in the shrubs, near hotels, walking through the upstairs housing uh, above the bar. Uh, he was in vehicles at some points. Uh, the trauma at the bridge again, the gravel pit, uh, the scent that walks off from the gravel pit for some unexplained reason. Um, it's just it's a lot of movement for a heavily intoxicated person. Um, so obviously if they are in fact all him, there had to be 
vehicles involved. There had to be people helping him involved. There's no way he could have gotten all over this fucking town by himself, in my opinion. Um, it also, you have to factor in that maybe a lot of it could be transfer if this person had, um, maneuvered his drunk body at multiple times during the night if they were cleaning up vomit or if he had vomited on them if they had come in contact with his vomit it's very well possible that his scent would be stronger on them and subsequently followed in places that this person went to either while with jeff or after he departed from jeff's company Another thing that stands out to me is the autopsy findings not matching with the body floating dead in a river for 43 days. It's confusing. Um, the fact that it was lacking fluids, I mean, to the point where it didn't even have fluids in the fucking eyeballs. Like, I... I what? Like, oddly enough, he wasn't dehydrated or mummified, and he was floating in water, so why, why is there no blood in his body why is there no liquid in his eyeballs or you know the urine thing i can i can pass that on that one that one he could have peed right before he died or he could have peed as he was dying who knows um now the lack of blood in his body did stand out to kevin as well and he did make note in the book that he decided to sorry he um met up with morticians you know people who handle um bodies for burial um, these bodies oftentimes, actually more often than not, actually show up with bl blood still in them. And he asked them, okay, so like, what's the process of essentially uh, draining the body so that you can then put, you know, embalming fluid in and they can be put in their caskets or, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, the morticians themselves said that the most efficient way to um, express blood from the body would be to have them placed at an ang downward angle uh, where they would then make incisions at the uh like carotid arteries at the neck uh not huge ones but you know substantial size notable size uh where they would then let gravity do its work and let the blood drain out at which point they then clean them up put embalming fluid and they're on their way however the uh, medical examiner's report didn't make any mention of incisions or markings on the neck or anywhere else on the body, for that matter, that could indicate that his body was drained of blood, uh, either during or after his death. Um, Gannon himself also looked over what autopsy, autopsy photos, stuttering and shit, uh, that he did have. Um, and the ones that did have the neck insight didn't show any incisions as well as any others that covered the body that there just wasn't any injuries that could pertain to that uh type of procedure let's call it that um now the rigor mortis kind of uh freaked me out a little bit too uh, again max 72 hours for his body to go through the motions of rigor mortis now if he's been missing and presumed dead for 43 days how is it that he's only showing signs of up to 72 hours worth of decomposition and his body still has rigor mortis i mean logically speaking the guy couldn't have been dead in the river for 43 days without some sort of you know intervention of some kind uh, it's just a lot here. Uh, you know, the Carl dude is odd to me as well. Um, but then the van belonging to Karen, it, there isn't any further explanation as to its relevance to the case. It, it is weird. Uh, the dog did hit on it, just like it hit on Carl's car. Um, again, maybe it was transfer. Maybe this chick was the chick he was talking to that night and, you know, she got in her fucking van and the dog smelled it. I, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's a lot to consider and it's a lot to question. Um, as far as I know, his case was closed as an accidental drowning. I do believe the manor was still listed as undetermined. Um, but it just doesn't seem at this point that it would be a case to close on that basis alone. Um, but with that, we're going to leave off right there. Uh, Part two is going to pick up on the next victims and kind of the turning point victim, if you will. So the uh, next victim we have will be Patrick uh, Runigan. 
And uh, eventually we will hit on Jared Dion, who is the one who was the turning point for the Smiley Face Killers theory. It was also the turning point for the town of Lacrosse itself, where they were just like, all right, come on, what the fuck is going on here? But we'll get into that on part two. Um, we'll also be covering um, the beginnings of the theory itself. Um, how it got its name, how it's progressed outside of lacrosse as well. Um, because this isn't just centralized to this town. Um, it's neighboring states, uh, it's neighboring towns, it's it's kind of spread a bit and it's created a lot of concern for people. But trust me, there's just there's a shit ton more. Uh it gets creepy, it gets mysterious, it gets more scientific y as well, and you're not gonna want to miss it. So Part two should be coming probably within the next week. I will try to get it out sooner. But in the meantime, stew on this for a bit. Uh, let me know what your guys' theories are, what you agree with, what you don't agree with. Uh, and then uh, while you're at it, also check out those books. The The books are good reading and even the docuseries. I mean, I kind of shat on it a little bit because I'm not going to lie. There are parts of it that get a little like, like cringy, but uh, and not in a good way, like in a Really, you're going to say that's on national television type of way. But the cases themselves are fabulous. They're thought-provoking and they're sad, but they're also, they just get you thinking, what the fuck's going on? Um, and I hope to actually cover some of those either in part two, part three. We'll see how far we get as this progresses. But in the meantime, thank you for listening, guys. And until next time, stay safe.